Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. So in one of the previous videos, we essentially had a setup like this, where we had one laser and another laser being joined together in a coupler and then hitting a photodiode, which is then connected to an oscilloscope. That was to um, measure the, um, the spectrum of the incoming electrical signal. Now we have replaced that just with an electrical spectrum analyzer, but essentially it's the same idea. What we saw is that the total electric field hitting the photodiode will be given by the sum of these two electric fields, which are oscillating at two different optical frequencies. Then the uh, power measured at the photodiode will simply be given by the absolute square of this expression, which you can show is equal to, well, two terms here that are just sort of constant, and then this term here that oscillates with a frequency equal to the difference between these two optical frequencies. So for example, if these two laser frequencies are spaced one gigahertz apart, then we'll measure one gigahertz electrical signal coming out of the photodiode using the, the device over here. So you can imagine that if both of these lasers are uh, completely perfect, then they're just like narrow straight lines. Then, then in the, uh, the ESA spectrum here, we're just going to see a single straight line here centered at omega 2 minus omega 1. But of course we can see that. Let's suppose we, we assume that, I don't know, um, let's say omega 1 is like perfectly fixed, it doesn't move at all, but then omega 2 is a slightly imperfect oscillator, meaning that it's sort of the frequency that changes a little bit over time, like it sort of shakes back and forth. Well, in that case, what we're going to see is something a little bit like this. So the power spectral density in the optical domain for the first laser will just be a, a straight line. We're going to assume that's perfect and never changes. It's always an ideal laser. But then um, the power spectral density of the second laser is slightly broader because its line sort of shakes back and forth a bit. It gets a bit smeared out. Well, then the signal we measure on the ESA is essentially going to look like this. So it'll be centered at the frequency difference between the two lasers, and then the width is going to be determined only by um, by the second laser here. Now, essentially, this is a way to measure the line width of the second laser um, with a high degree of confidence. So, the, um, again, the idea is that we interfere these two lasers on the photo layout and then measure the, the width here on the electrical spectrum analyzer, and then we can determine what is the stability of the, the second laser. But the issue with doing, with, with doing this is that, of course, we need uh, we need to ensure that laser 1 has a line width that's much, 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 much smaller than the line width of uh, laser 2 in order for this to work. But that kind of runs into a, what you can call a chicken and egg problem because, uh, well, if we need this laser in order to determine that this laser is very stable, like how do we determine that this laser is stable in the first place? So to do that, we can uh, use a slightly different technique that relies on an acoustic optic much later. Let me show that over here. So we can move the paper correctly. Let's plug this out here for now. So. In this setup, we're actually going to measure the line width of a laser using the laser itself. The idea is that we send the laser into a coupler, which then splits it 50-50 between two branches. One branch um, is delayed by 100 kilometers or some appropriately large distance, and then is sent onto the photodiode, where the other branch goes into what's called an acoustic optic modulator that's being driven with a 200 megahertz sine wave. So essentially an acoustic modulator is just a device that sends um, sound waves through a crystal that the light is traveling, light is traveling through, and then that, that then shifts the frequency by uh, 200 megahertz in this case. We then send the signal back onto the photodiode and then uh, connect that to the electrical spectrum analyzer. Now the idea behind, um, behind this setup, the reason why we need a 100 kilometer delay line is that we want to essentially ensure that um, the wave from the second branch and the wave from the first branch are uh, decohering. So the point is that if you want to measure the line width, you have to see that the, what happens when the uh, phase of the frequency has sort of randomly shifts around. But if we don't have a 100 kilometer delay line, then these two are going to shift in sync and we will really detect the line width. But if we have a very large delay line here, they're just going to shift sort of randomly against each other and then we'll actually get an appropriate, um, appropriate measurement. So to see how that might look in the spectral domains, essentially we'd have, um, let's say, the light coming from branch number one right here, it simply has some kind of um, frequency width in the optical domain that um, you know, has some magnitude that's inherent to the, the laser. And of course, the light coming from the second branch will have an identical magnitude here. Maybe I should indicate that this will also have some frequency width delta f. The point is then that when these two um, light signals interfere at the photodiode, then they're going to create this like, smeared out signal here that we'll see on the electrical spectrum analyzer. It will be centered at the driving frequency of the acoustic optic modulator. And because these two widths sort of are uh, you know, oscillating or varying randomly and without synchronization, then the width we see is actually two times 
the inherent line width of the laser. Okay, that was quite a long explanation, but let's actually see how this works in action. Okay, here we see the DFB laser that we're going to test for a determinate uh, line width. So right now, it is actually being sent into a neighboring laboratory. Maybe I can actually show that. It's going all the way through this fiber that you can see up here. And this is the, the thick fiber right here I'm talking about. It's going into this one and all the way up here under the ceiling tiles and into our secondary lab here. And now, the reason why I'm doing this is that the, um, the function generator or the sine wave generator inside of the setup, which is right here, if it's too close to the electrical spectrum analyzer, then it can actually work as an antenna that then sends a 200 megahertz signal onto the um, onto the ESA and then disturbs the measurement we actually want to do. So I'm just putting it in here to make sure there's no interference and no no uh, funny business going on. So anyway, the signal is coming out from the other lab right here, it, and I realize it's a bit messy. But essentially, what happens is that the signal gets split inside of this coupler here, and then the light inside of the let me see that would be the blue branch here goes into this acoustical modulator. I see it's put inside of a box just for safety. That's being driven with the electrical signal here. So the light comes out, um, has been shifted by 200 megahertz, then it goes into the secondary coupler, then goes to the back to the other lab. And the other uh, branch of this first coupler here, the red line, I think it is, goes into a um, 100 kilometer fiber spool in order to, to delay it, as I just explained. And then the output of that goes into the other port of this um, this coupler and then back to the secondary lab using another, a different fiber. So that'll be this one. It's another fiber we have running into the, the other lab. So instead of the, the thick one, it's like this thin one here. And that goes, as you can see, all the way like this here. We didn't bother to put up under the tile this time. We just let it sort of hang free. And then back into the first lab. Let me get my key card out. As you can see, this is also kind of a nice demonstration of why I think fiber optics is so cool, because if I wanted to send a beam of a free space light all the way to a different lab, I'd need a whole arrangement of like mirrors and uh, that would be really complicated to set up. But here I can just plug in a cable in one end, plug another end, and you just have light being passed, even though I don't have to, I don't have to you know, direct the beam around like opticals or anything. It just, go, it just works. So anyway, this light beam that now contains both the uh, delayed light from the 100 kilometer spool and the frequency shift light from the AOM goes into this uh, photo diode right here, which is then connected to the electrical spectrum analyzer, as we can see here. All right, so let me just hook up the camera here. Like so, the arm here is a bit in the way. That should work. And now I can actually turn on the laser, and we should be able to see a peak appearing here at 200 megahertz. So I'm turning up the laser power, and there we go. So you can definitely see a, a peak now. And this particular curve shape here is actually what's called a, a Lorentzian. So it basically goes as 1 over 1 plus x squared, and um, essentially that comes out of um, the fact that a, a light wave inside of a DFB laser can be modeled a little bit like um, a damped harmonic oscillator. And if you ever modeled that in maybe introductory physics, you know that um, essentially, it's uh, well. If you look at the the time domain, it's like a sine wave that sort of gets damped like this. Um, but um, if you look at the frequency spectrum, then you'll you'll see it has this Lorentzian shape. That something you may have modeled before. So anyway, let's think about what the inherent line width of this laser here is going to be. Now, the way we typically talk about it is to specify the 3 dB bandwidth. So let me just change this here just a little bit. Maybe we can actually increase it slightly. I want to try and make sure that it hits one of the points. Okay, that's good. So let me select, I think we can do marker somewhere here. Might even be able to, uh, where is it again? Measure. Does it do full width or maximum? No, it actually doesn't. Let me try is it this one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so P point is here around 200 megahertz. So we want to figure out when has it decreased by 3 dB. So we can look at this number right here. Let's see when do we go to, let's see it's around negative 30 right now, here negative 29, so we need to go um, essentially additional negative 3, so that'll be negative 32 we need to go to, somewhere around here. 
So it seems like this one has a bandwidth of around 5 megahertz approximately, or something like that. So we know that the inherent line width has to be 2.5 megahertz. Now just for a good measure, let's uh, try to go to trace, that should be here, and then press view. So now we should have the yield tracer fixed in place. And then we can activate the second trace here, and select average. Notice I'm averaging 100 traces, so it's, uh, it's a bit more clean. And I'm going to actually turn the laser off, and then I'm going to switch to the second laser I have standing right next to it, right here. So this one should have a different inherent line width. We should be able to see that. So we're going to have to disconnect this cable right here and plug it in right there. See if we can do this with one hand. Yeah, it should be fine. And then I have to take the other cable here and also plug it in so we can control both the temperature and the current, even though it's only really the current that we care about at the moment. Well, I guess we don't even care about that. So uh, now I have to make sure I replace this fiber right here. I can actually get my camera to stand perhaps just barely, maybe. There we go. So I'm just going to disconnect this one right here and then plug in the other laser so we can see how the two line bits compare. So let me clean this up. I'm going to turn on the second laser right now. So we should have a little bit of power coming here. So now just for good measure, I'm going to increase the power until it is identical to the one for the, the first trace. Oh, I think the diode might be overloaded right now. It seems to be complaining down here in the bottom left corner. Yeah, it is complaining a little bit that the photo diode is leaving too much power. So we're going to reduce it slightly more. Okay, I think that should be good. All right, so now we can already see that the um, needle trace here seems a little bit more narrow. Honestly, it's kind of interesting that it seems like the 3dB width is almost the same in this case, but it's as if this one has like slightly uh, lower skirt. It's kind of kind of surprising actually. Let me see if I can select marker and marker number two. So I'm not really sure what this one's trying to do at the moment. Is it even attached to the correct trace? No. Now this one's still on the yellow trace. Can we actually switch it to the other one? Let's try and find out. Uh, oof, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> well, anyway, I guess you can uh, you can sort of see the point that clearly there is a difference in the uh, in the overall spectral behavior of um, of these two lasers because they they are different. And this one has like really sort of wide skirts. This one has sort of slightly shorter skirts, which means that it's it's a bit more coherent than the than the first one. So maybe I should just explain like why is it that we might expect one laser to have a uh, sort of narrow line with another one. And essentially, you can imagine that if the laser light simply consists of a light wave bouncing back and forth inside of an optical cavity, then if the cavity has a very low reflectance, it doesn't really take very many bounces before the, um, that current wave sort of leaks out of the cavity and the new one arises because of the, the gain medium inside of, the, inside of the, the cavity. So you can sort of imagine every time a new wave sort of exits the uh, cavity completely and then uh, another one sort of starts from, from scratch then it's going to be a change in the phase and that's going to be detected as a shift right here but if you have a cavity with very very um, highly reflective surfaces then the wave can bounce for a very long time before it escapes and then it takes a long time before any kind of sort of sudden random phase shift happens and then um, there's fewer or smaller random phase shifts and then we have a more narrow and less um, less broad line width here Okay, so I hope that gives you some insight into how we can measure the line width of a laser. Stay tuned for more videos.